Tere kõigile liitujatele. Alustame siis koosujutud profidega podcasti. Plaan on seda siis teha igal pühapäeval, kui korvpallikooli on karantiinis ja hoida teid kuidagi meeskonnaga kursis, et praegude saalis käia ei saa. Mängudele saata ainult interneti vahendusel või teleka vahendusel kaas elada, et nüüd on ja võimalus natuke meeskonna liikmetega ka lähemalt tutvustaja. Esimesena külalisena on mul siin meie VIP launchis külas Emanuel Vembi, meie esindusmeeskonna keskmängi. Hi Emanuel, how are you doing? Ma räägin siis Emanueliga, räägin inglise keeles, et kui kellegil on tõlkimisel abi vaja, siis kutsugi julgelt ema, isa või keegi vanemates kõrvale, kes saab teid tõlkimisel aidata. Kui kellegil on küsimusi, siis kirjutage need sinna Zoomi tšäti, et mingi aeg ma vaatan seal tšätis, kui on mõni huvitav küsimus, siis ma küsin Emanuelid seda. Meie teid praegu ei kuule, teie mikrofonid on välja lülitatud, et pildiga te küsimusi paraku esitada ei saa, et kirjutage küsimused palun tšäti. Plaalis on tagasi natuke juttu rääkida umbes pool tundi ja siis viimased 15 minutit vaatame ka siit telekast mõned mänguolukorjad ja analüüsime neid ja küsime, kuidas Emanuel neid olukordi näeb. Ma teen veel ajal kontrolli, näidake mulle põhjalt üles, kui te kuulete hästi meid. Nii. Väga hea, okei, alustame siis. All right, Emanuel. I know that you're an American citizen, but your name says that you have some African roots. Can you talk about your origin and something about your family and how did you end up in America? Okay, well, my whole family, like you said, I was born in Charlotte. I'm from America. Charlotte, North Carolina, but my whole family is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, that's like Central Africa. Um, my whole family, my father's side and my mother's side, and uh, my mother decided to have to come to the States for new opportunities around 1993. And my father came to the States around 1988 for new opportunities as well during like refugee times in the Congo. And um, they ended up meeting each other in, in Charlotte because uh, there's a huge African community on in Charlotte, North Carolina. So they ended up meeting each other um, through friends and everything like that. And they decided to get together and have me uh, in 97. Mm -hmm. so. so can you tell a little something about Congo? What, what's it, where is it situated? Uh, is it a big country? Is it a small country? Congo is a huge country. I think, uh, if I'm not correct, I think it's the second largest country in, in Africa, in the whole continent. Um, it's a really rich country. When I mean rich, it has a lot of big, like a lot of natural resources and like that. It was fun founded by um, Belgium colonists um, during the King Leopold times. Um, and it's a really beautiful country. I haven't been there yet. I always want to go. I'm actually planning on going this summer with my you mother. You haven't been there? Yeah, I haven't been there yet. I'm planning to go this summer actually with my mother because my mother has businesses in Congo. Okay. And I just want, I want to go for, you know, some vacation time and see Congo for the first time. Every time my mother went, I didn't, I wasn't able to go because of school when I was younger or basketball. Does your grandma or grandpa living still in Congo or so, some other relatives? Yes, I have other relatives still in Congo, but most of my family on my mother and father's side, um, we have a huge family, like a very big family. But most of my family actually resides in Europe, in France or Belgium. So that's where I've been a lot of my time. I either go to France or Belgium. My grandmother actually stays in, stays in Belgium right now. Okay, mm -hmm. so international family. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you... Uh, were born in Charlotte and mm -hmm. you grew up in Charlotte, uh, Charlotte as I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about Charlotte as a city? Uh, you said it's in North Carolina, mm -hmm. so where yeah. is it situated? How is the small city, big city? So is it, uh... Charlotte is the biggest city in North Carolina. It's actually the third growing city in America right now. Um, 
Charlotte is when I was young, Charlotte was smaller. When I mean smaller, it was it really wasn't a, like a lot of architectural stuff like buildings and let's say a big apartments or nice fancy stuff. It was a lot of trees because like the North Carolina area is like really that's a lot of mountains in that area. But uh, now, man, Charlotte is, is really big. It's, it's growing every day. Like every time, like last year when I was in Croatia and I went back to Charlotte, it was crazy to see how much it, it has changed. And I'm pretty sure it's changing a lot now, but it's a really big city. It's a really, uh, really nice weather and the summer is very hot. Um, in the winter, it doesn't snow as much as it does here in Estonia. But uh, when it snows, it, it, you know, it snows there. Yeah, it snows okay. uh, a little bit. But when it snows, you know, it's it's more like the the kind of weather we had here like a couple of weeks ago with the ice where like it snows and then it turns into ice for a while. So that's the type of snow North Carolina gets or, and in Charlotte. But Charlotte is a it's a growing city right now. There's a lot of things big happening. Um, when when I mean big, I mean like a lot of events, uh, celebrities come to Charlotte. The president always comes to Charlotte now every summer. So it's it's a really nice city. It's 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 getting too big. Sometimes I think that because when I was young, I I, I used to love it when it was small. Now with because it's a big city, is like so much traffic with cars and so many things going on sometimes. Mm. And you know yeah. sometimes it's nice to have a small city where you know everybody. So. In what kind of neighborhood did you grow up? Uh, was it like in the central city or in the suburbs? Or? So I grew up, so I, let's say I had two sides of growing up in Charlotte. Uh, so my mother and father didn't stay together. They weren't married. Mm. So my, my mother, we stayed in the suburbs. So we was away from the city, maybe 20 minutes outside of the city. And then my father, we stayed in the middle of the city, you know, where a lot of stuff was going on and, uh, like uh it was let's say it wasn't my side my my father's side of the day uh where he stayed it wasn't really the best neighborhood to stay in but i was only really there like on the weekends or when i went to go visit my father's side mm. of the family but when my mother we was on like like i said the suburbs away from the city about 20 minute drive to if you want to go to the mall or go to city center like maybe 30 minute drive to go to city center mm. mm -hmm. so can you Describe your average day when you were like, let's say, a ten-year-old Emmanuel. Okay, do you have a nick nickname? Yeah, I have. I have plenty. Emmanuel uh, is a really long name. Yeah, Can I call I got, it something shorter? So I have plenty of nicknames. Oh, uh, I have TJ. TJ. The reason people call me TJ is because my middle name. I have my grandfather on my father's side's first name as my middle name. It's an African name. It's, it's Tonjo. So it's spelled T-O-N-D-J-O. And they called me, it's, um, they nick, uh, nicknamed me TJ just for that, because as I was growing up, my father only called me by my middle name as a kid. So growing up my whole life until now, still sometimes people call me TJ. But mm. really, it's uh, people call me uh, Manny, too, M-A-N-N-Y, like uh, Manny Pacquiao, mm -hmm. because it's short for Emmanuel. Or sometimes some, some um, friends of mine would just call me E, you know, okay. either E, Manny or TJ. For uh, for this time you have stayed there, I have called you Manu yeah. from Emmanuel Ginobili. Uh -huh. So I'm not saying your games are similar, but <laughs> can I continue with this? Oh, for okay. sure, yeah. Um, Manu, so describe your average day as a 10-year-old kid mm. growing up in Charlotte, uh, getting to know basketball, uh, so, hanging around with friends. How was it? 10 years old. I'm going to go, I'm going to talk about a... I'm going to do a school day and then I'm going to do a summer day when there's no school. So school, obviously, OK, I will go to school around, get ready, wake up six in the morning, go to school. School starts around 815, I think 10 years old what year. That's maybe fifth grade, I think, or fourth grade. Yeah. Um, so I will go to school. I'm at school all day, you know, everything, activities going on, learning. I will come home and if it's a weekday, I was only allowed to be outside for maybe an hour or two hours during the day, or let's say until the, the sunlight went down sometime. So by the time I got home, it was three o'clock. Sunlight maybe goes down in Charlotte around seven o'clock. So I had to finish any homework I had to do first. So that maybe take about a, two hours to do with my sister, with my older sister. She used to help me a lot. And then I could, I would go outside maybe for an hour or two hours 
ride bikes with my friends, uh, play basketball at the park, um, play American football, or go to my, I will go, sometimes I'll go to my father's house and play with my brothers and, you know, hang out with them back when uh, people used to go outside in the States all the time. Now yeah. everybody's more inside. And the summer day, it would be, I would be outside all day. And as soon as I wake up, eat breakfast, play basketball, literally all day, I will go to a recreational center called the YMCA in, in the States. And I would play basketball literally all day with my friends, break time for like one hour, two hours, get something to eat, and then come back and play some more basketball. Or we'll go, sw there's a swimming pool at this recreational center too. And we will swim maybe for two hours or one hour and then go back to playing more basketball. So was it like an organized basketball practice or did you just get together and play? I just got together and play. So more, more, I would say 90% of it was just get together and play. It was no right. organized. That's usually how it is, especially in the States. You know, as a young kid, it's you guys, hey, you got you. Let's say me and my brothers, we'll come, we'll wake up in the morning and do everything before we're, you know, we're allowed to go outside. Our parents say it's okay to go outside, get on our bikes and go knock on our friends' doors and be like, hey, can you come outside today? And then we'll go knock on other friends' door. You got you coming outside today. And we'll get maybe 10 to 15 guys. Everybody say, oh, we're coming outside. Boom, we come outside. We meet at the park or we meet at the recreational center and we just play pickup basketball or we play American football or we play, you know, some other outside games. And that's just that's that's the culture in America It's like just round up a, a bunch of people and just say, hey, let's go outside. Or if there's a new guy that's moving into the neighborhood or the apartment complex, mm -hmm. we'll be like, hey, you want to, you know, you have any friends yet? Hey, you know, we there's a couple of us going here to do this mm -hmm. and they would tag along with us. Okay, so who taught you how to dribble, how to shoot, how to pass? Uh, All of that who really... Who was your first coach? My, Let's say that. my first real basketball coach for me to say came at the age of 16 honestly so before that but before that self-learned man yeah really just see what whatever was on tv and i just try to go outside and do it um i watched the nba a lot when i was a kid even to this day i still watch the nba a lot but um it's really just really just go outside and just do it really that's that's mm. kind of how it is in the states a lot and i had an older brother excuse me i had an older brother he he was more into american football but he still played basketball like just for fun so he would play with us and he was way older than us he's um he's seven he's 16 years older than uh than me mm. so obviously he knew the fundamentals like the small stuff of how to play basketball and he used to teach us when we were young outside you know he'll come outside mm. and play with us and then the rest just came along just with me just going outside yeah i played a little bit of basketball when i was eight eight years old i think or nine years old one uh two years for two years but it wasn't anything where it was really structured where i was learning and understanding the fundamentals yeah. of basketball it was really just hey come here on saturday mornings let's play this team and then you can go back home mm -hmm. Did you follow some uh, specific NBA players that you tried to oh. uh, model your game like? Or for sure, now, for now and then, my favorite player is Hakeem Olajuwon. That's my favorite all-time basketball player. Why? Because he could. He at that time he was able to do it all. He wasn't the most physically strong guy, but he was really detailed in the in the in the moves that he he was doing. Um, he was fast. He was mobile. He was a he was a big that that can jump high. He can shoot the fifteen footer. He can he can post hook. He can face up. He can play back to the basket. And I feel like if if let's say now if you put Hakeem Olajuwon at his prime in the NBA now, I believe he can play in the NBA now, even because he would be able to develop a even further shot to play. Mm -hmm. You know. 30 feet behind, I mean, 30 feet away from the basket. But guys that I modeled my game off of when I was young, because I didn't watch Akeem until I say I was 15, was Kevin Garnett. Um, Maybe Lamar somebody from Charles Hornets, no? Not really. Not, not from the Hornets. Uh, oh, I take that back. 
Morning, Alonzo Morning. I used to love watching Alonzo Morning because my father loved Alonzo Morning. He played for the Charlotte Hornets uh, for a lot of for plenty of years. Um, who was Kevin Garnett? Okay, I would use Alonzo Morning, um, Lamar Odom, and LeBron James. So you liked more of a skilled player, not a powerful, strong player like Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah, no. I like more skill, but when I was young, a lot of plays, a lot of my friends used to call me Shaquille O'Neal because I was bigger than everybody else mm -hmm. as far as my my weight and my height. I was always the tallest kid between my friends. Okay, so growing up, you were always the tallest in your class. Mm, always in the neighborhood. Always everywhere. Okay. So did they put you in the post and play as a big man, or you could? Oh, uh, when I started playing back, when I was yeah in those little leagues mm. and. I, they, they they always put me in the post. Every coach put, say, hey, you got to be a post player. You know, I kind of, I don't like that system a little bit, but I understand why people were doing that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, looking back on it, I don't, I don't like that. Even now, like if I ever become a coach, I don't think I would, hey, if you're super tall, you got to be a post player. It's, I feel like it's good to have those fundamentals, yes. But mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't agree so much on, just doing that because there's so much more to the game of basketball than just saying hey do a hook shot or do a post move yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. and hakeem was a good example of that he could do really everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I, I i assume because you grew up in charlotte you uh, were a charlotte hornets fan you and your family oh yeah. is it true so we definitely supported. My father is a huge Hornets fan, and he loved basketball. So we used to go to Charlotte Hornets games a lot. I have like when the Charlotte Hornets was really famous when they uh, back in the '90s. Obviously, I was young. I was born in '97, but I have pictures of like them holding me as a baby in the game, and my brothers and my older brother and sister at the game, and all of us traveling to the game. And I have like old. Uh, Charlotte Hornets like gear and wardrobe from when my father we used to wear them and I'll be I have them now I still wear them to this day but mm. my father was very a huge fan of the Charlotte Hornets um we used to go to games like I said and then obviously when they turned into the Bobcats at that time that's the only professional team in the, in the state of North Carolina we used to go to games all the time okay mm -hmm. uh, so these uh, Charlotte Bobcats years they were not so so good for the fans yeah. mm -mm. No. How would you describe those years? Was it, was it difficult? For sure, for it was. Fan? It was definitely difficult because, as the as the reason the Hornets people in Charlotte love the Hornets a lot is because of the the entertainment. Yes, they were a good team, and they they never won a championship or they never been to the Eastern Conference Finals. But each year, they always played like with passion. It looked like the Bobcats at the time for, I think there was a, a organization for maybe seven years, I believe. It looked like there was no entertainment coming to the games. It looked like there was no passion sometimes. Um, but there was two years, I remember for sure, they, they were really good. They were able to make the playoffs and play mm -hmm. good. Um, unfortunately, they lost in the first round, but it was that year alone, it was a lot of excitement in the city with the Charlotte Bobcats. But that year, I would say it just it just looked like it wasn't too much passion and the fans and the, the people, the citizens of Charlotte wasn't really happy with the Bobcats because back when the Hornets was there, it was a lot of excitement, a lot of entertainment. It, it was passion on the floor and guys looked like they wanted to at least you know, try to succeed enough to be champions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my next ne next question would be when, uh, okay, you were all, all, all the time growing up in this basketball env environment. You played mm -hmm. basketball, you watched basketball. Mm -hmm. At what, what point did you start dreaming of becoming a basketball player? I think, I think in America, um, that's everyone's dream. That's every young, child's dream i oh now i wouldn't say everyone i would say the majority of children is to be a professional athlete i dreamt it my whole life especially as a kid but i didn't take it serious for me to say i want to be a professional basketball player or i want to be a basketball player until i was at the age of maybe 17 16 years old when i where i developed an understanding on how long or how hard 
or what you have to do to become a professional. I wish I I grasped that idea when I was younger. Then I would it would I would have changed my mindset. It would have changed my my abilities on the basketball court. I would have had a different type of work ethic on the basketball court. But when I was young, I always thought about being a basketball player. I just mm-hmm. didn't know how I needed to do it, who should help me do it, where I can get the resources to become better, who I need to train with, how I need to train. I, I didn't have that as a kid, but growing up, I always had the mindset of, I want to be like this guy. I used to have posters of LeBron James in my wall, in my room, in my wall. Uh, Kevin Garnett, like I mentioned, you know, these these guys that I looked up to all the time. And I'm I'm like, man, I wish I can have that. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, at you know, when you're young and back in the day when I was younger, they used to say, you know, they used to ask us in school, what you want to be when you grow up? I used to always say basketball player every time. Some teachers would say, you know, try to think for something else that's logical that you can accomplish mm. because not to say that you can't accomplish being a basketball player, but that's very hard to do, you know. And so, and then one day I always remember, like, my, I came home, I told my mother that, and my mother told me, don't ever listen to, you know, someone that tells you that. I always dream big and have faith in what you can accomplish. So that always stuck with me. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned your mother mm-hmm. because uh, I know that you have a really strong relationship with your mother mm-hmm. and your sister and your brother. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your family and uh, how this... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, okay, in the African culture, family is very important. It's, that's just number one thing in the African culture. It's very important to be have your families back and to love your family and support your family. So in my family, it's uh, I have... It's five of us as siblings. So I have three other brothers and then one sister. Um, and then I have my mother. Um, I lost my father when I was 13. And um, ever since I lost my father, me and my mother, I started taking the opportunity to take time to spend a lot more time with my mother. My mother was working a lot. You know, she was, she's a nurse. So she works in a hospital. There's really no off days a lot with, you know, with being a nurse, you know, you're probably working six to, I say five to six days a week, Mm -hmm. you know, and the hours are basically all day, depending on which shift that you take. So with that being said, you know, I started to always wanted to be around my mother. My mother's like my best friend. She's my number one support person. After every game here in, in for Tartu, it's like she calls me after every game. She's watching the game, like, oh, you're watching the game? Every game. She's like, oh, I don't know what they're saying in Estonian, but I just know that they're saying something good about you and the team. And, you know, my it's just very important in the African culture to, you know, have your families mm-hmm. back because if you don't have your family, like at the end of the day, you can meet people that's going to support you, but the people that's going to support you the most that's always going to be there for you are the ones that truly love you and then my mother is is, and my whole family are people that 100 percent love me because they know what i've been through they know how much i uh something means to me and they understand that they're going to be the ones that support me when the people you know who doesn't want to support me or talks down on me and stuff like that Mm, so that's true um okay We talked a little bit about your dreams of becoming a basketball player and uh, mm-hmm. your your mother saying that don't ever give up. Mm-hmm. So when when did you make your first proper team? And uh, uh, when we talked uh, ourselves before, you mentioned that you got cut mm-hmm. a, a lot of times. Mm-hmm. That uh, this uh, rejection and re- uh, re- rejection after rejection uh, build your character and fire inside mm-hmm. so can you ex- expand a little bit yeah about this topic mm-hmm. so when uh so going into middle school seventh grade that's the first time you can play for your school in america is is seventh grade is when you can play organized basketball for your school so seventh grade i think at that age i'm 11 years old i think I want to say 10 or 11 years old. Seventh grade. Seventh grade. I think it's more. 12? 12. Maybe 12. 11, 12 years old. Maybe. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So from seventh grade to 11th grade, that's five. That's that's five. That's four years of being rejected on a basketball team. So 
every year, my first year of trying out for a team, like I said, my seventh grade, I went out there. Okay, these guys, this, first of all, this is my first time trying to be on an actual basketball team. Like, I've, I haven't played mm. for a basketball team yet. So I go out there and, you know, we have like a, some conditioning tests. And, you know, we go out there and do some, you know, some basketball training on a court, work on layups, shooting, a couple plays, playing some scrimmages. Okay, I don't make the team. Okay, that's my first time trying out for a team. So I'm I'm disappointed, but I'm not so hurt because I know I have another shot. And and at the same time, the team that I tried out for, which was my school, that school was really good at basketball. They only took two seventh graders that year. So I'm if they only take two seventh graders, may, maybe as an eighth grader, I have a shot to hmm. make the team. So I come back next year as an eighth grader. I try out. I don't make the team. So now I'm even more disappointed. Like, oh, okay, maybe am I good enough? This and that. I go talk to my mother. She says, don't worry, just keep just keep working. You're gonna make it eventually at this time. You know, just keep pushing. So, you know, I'm I'm just a kid. I'm not really worried about it. I come into my next year. So ninth grade, I try out for a team. Now I'm now it's I'm in high time. school. Yeah, this now, yes, this is the third time. Now I'm in high school. These are basically the same guys I grew up with, I go to school with. You know, some some of these guys that are making the team are my friends. You know, these are, these are guys I play basketball with outside every day, or I play basketball with on in the summer. These are you know my these are my friends, people I grew up with. I know my whole life. So ninth grade comes, I miss it again. But this is the first time. Now you're in high school. High school now is every whoever makes the team is from ninth grade to twelfth grade. So now this is people from the age group of thirteen to 18 years old. Hmm. So, you know, or depending on if you come into high school young, you're 13. So that's a, it's tough now. At, now I understand it's tougher to make the team because you have four grade levels mm -hmm. trying to make the team. Okay, I don't make the team. I'm, I have the same mindset as when I was in the seventh grade. I'm young, you know, I'm, this is my first year trying out for the high school team now. So, okay, I go again the next year. Now I don't make it. Now my mother questions, starts to question like, okay, you know, you sure you want to keep going? Like, I know you, this is what you want to do. Are you sure you want to keep going? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go again next year. Like, I'm not worried. You know, and, you know, I told you when, you know, one day off, off camera, I really wasn't, I wasn't in the most, in the best shape at the time too. I was, I was a pretty chubby kid. You know, I was, you know, pretty fat, let's say that as, as a young guy. So let's say the conditioning, my conditioning wasn't good, wasn't good enough to be on the basketball team. I'm not saying that the coach couldn't help me get better in mm -hmm. that, but he decided not to take me. That was one of the reasons. So 11th grade come, I try out again. And this time they have, like each tryout is a, is a, there's three cuts you have to make. You have to, they, it's maybe, let's say 40 guys come out there. They cut, they cut the first 10 guys, then you make it to the next round. They cut the next 10 guys, then it's was this 20 players left. And then they cut five, they cut maybe from five to seven guys, mm -hmm. and then that's 13, and then that's the team. So this time, my 11th grade year, I made it past the first two cuts. My first year, I, I never the mm -hmm. other years I never made it past the other cuts. This time I made it all the way to the last one. I come there, so the last tr tryout day was Saturday. So Saturday, I'm on the, it's, it's, it's uh, 20, 20 of us on the last day. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'm gonna make it this time. So I go to school on Monday morning. Every year they, they put the, the, the name of the team mm -hmm. on a sheet of paper, like on a door, on the basketball coach's door. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'm anticipating, I'm gonna make the team this year. This is the farthest I, I ever been. So I go Monday morning, I check, and I don't see my name on there. I'm disappointed. Now I'm really hurt because it's like I'm a junior in high school, which is 11th grade. This this is the time where college coaches start to recruit yeah. you. It's your junior year most of the time. So I'm very hurt. I go back home that day. Like I don't talk to nobody in school. My friends make the team again. Uh, and I go home. I tell my mom like I didn't make it again. You know. My at this time, my mom she tells me, 
she first she tells me it's okay like it's okay son don't put your head down you're always always be the head and not the tail she always tells me that be the head and not the tail but at the same time she always reminds me there's other things in life too other than just basketball but she always tells me she she told me at this time always push for what you love don't ever quit on what you love so i go again so after the whole that basketball season happens a new coach comes into my high school and you had one year left in high school i had one year left in high school that was your last chance my last chance my last chance so a new coach comes into the high school this is my man i still talk to him every day this is my high school coach he comes in and he looks at let's say the team that, the, the team that was here the returning players from last year and the prospects that can possibly make the team mm. so i'm one of those guys so he looks at me and he was like did you play on this this team before i was like no he was like i wonder why you never play cuz we we have like a let's say we play pickup basketball after school one day and he's like he asked me have you played on a team before and i was like no i was like i don't know why you never played on the team because the talent you just showed me today and this is pickup basketball you should be on this team so he invites me to the summer training camp i've never been invited to the summer training camp so i go to the summer training camp and i play and i play and i play so good that my coach the coach at the time he was saying that if you play this hard every day and get your conditioning to a level where you can be on my basketball team you will make the basketball team so that summer i dedicated myself to training very hard to get in good basketball shape and then i came into the school year i lost a lot of weight and my body got i got faster i got stronger at the time for for uh for a teenager and as the tryouts came along when school started i did good i was playing good i got better i developed and i finally made the team in my last year and i was so happy that i finally made the team in my last season of high school basketball so maybe the key word of your success that year was dedication dedication really literally focused on this one goal never give up i look back on it every day and i i tell myself not a, when it's your time when when something everyone in life has a purpose everyone in life has a purpose and I feel like everybody is going to fit, and eventually they find their purpose if they don't know what their purpose is. But for me, I feel like a per, my purpose right now, let's say now, is basketball. You know, and at the time, at that time it was still it was basketball for me too. It just didn't click where it was my time to to start basketball. You know, I wanted basketball so bad as a child but it wasn't my time to start playing bad. Maybe I needed to focus on being with my family because mm-hmm. I did just lose my father around that time. Maybe I needed to focus on you know doing something else, whatever I was doing at that time or at that age. But like you said, it was really dedication every year that just because someone says no to me doesn't mean I can't go out and you know and someone's going to say next yes to me the next year or the next opportunity that I have. You know, just trusting that my the faith that i have within myself and the belief i have within myself and my talents that eventually i'm going sh- i'm going to have the results of being a, a an achiever you know being an overcomer mhm uh so from there i want to go to my next question that when i see you play the game in tartu i see a lot of uh, enjoyment and a lot of passion and you're on the court you're really vocal and it seems like you're enjoying every minute of it mm-hmm. so is there a, a particular reason and is there a connection behind your past and uh, uh, and this uh, personality and character you have mm-hmm. become in basketball court mm-hmm. so i've 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 gotten that a lot where where i've been playing basketball in uh when my university even in Croatia my coach told me that there too that i have a lot of energy and then even here um it really just come from the love of the game you know i love i really love playing basketball like there's a saying love what you do and do what you love in in america and i i feel like at at this point i'm people can look at this as a job but for me it's not a job like i'm doing something that i love so much that i'm gonna put all my passion into 
basketball. I'm going to put all my energy into basketball because I know when it's all over and physically I can't play basketball no more because of age, I'm going I'm to miss the feeling of waking up in the morning to go play basketball or going to go train two, three times a day or, you know, playing a basketball game for 40 minutes and, you know, meet, being around guys that have the same um, goals and uh, same dreams as I do and meeting new friends or meeting new teammates. Like, it's fun for me to play basketball because I know that it can easily be taken away from me. It can be, it can easily go away. And I remember when I didn't have, let's say basketball in a sense of playing on a club team. Yes, I was able to go play basketball outside. That's fun mm -hmm. too. But being on a club and representing a city or representing a, a organization or representing a high school, middle school, college, wherever you represent it, it's, it's, it's fun to put on a jersey for them and they trust you to play for them. Like I'm gonna give them all my energy, no matter no matter what I have to do, if I got to mm. play, obviously right now I'm playing with this and I'm going to always give my energy no matter what. And it's just fun because it's something that I just really love to do. Mm -hmm. And it really shows. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe um, uh, we, don't, we don't have much time left, but let's talk really briefly about uh, your college days. Mm -hmm. Because in Estonia, I know a lot of basketball players in their high school years are dreaming about going to college in the States. Mm -hmm. So maybe to give them a little uh, description, oh, yeah. how's life in college for a basketball player? Who life, I would say is, as a college athlete, it's, it's difficult, but the whole process is fun. The whole process. The only reason it's difficult because you're a student athlete. So you the, you always got to remember that you're a student first. So you have to do all the school work, all the the homeworks, all the assignments. You maybe have in a semester, okay, you maybe have six or you maybe have, let's say, six classes, right, in a semester. Maybe you, if you want to take extra classes, you can, you know, if you think you can take on that load. So with six classes, you maybe have two or three classes each day, you know, for maybe one hour to two hours, depending on how long the class is. And then you have two practices every day in college or depending on how the coaches want to set up the schedule. So that's the reason why I say it's difficult because you're not only trying to perform so good in basketball, you're trying to perform good in school so you can gradu graduate. You have to have a certain a certain GPA to graduate and you have to have a certain GPA to even be on the basketball court and to practice. Um, but being a college athlete is fun, especially around this time in March. I don't know if you know, but like in, in the States it's something called March Madness. Mm -hmm. And it's like the best time to be a college, uh, a student athlete in America because you're playing in like the biggest tournament and it's, it's, it's uh, on national television. And it's like the best time, like it's so much fun um traveling with your teammates you know trying to beat these really good teams to, uh, to end up being a, the um, quoted the best team in college basketball at the time um the reason i say college basketball is good too you meet so many different people you meet so many different friends guys that you will stay connected with for the rest of your life mm -hmm. if you need somebody you know down the road whether it's in america or it's from an or you're let's say Estonia is going to America and you come back to Estonia to live, you will still have a good friend in America that you can always count on. Like when I was in a, when I was in college, I had a teammate that's from Slovenia. Slovenia. Yeah. Slovenia. So me and him, and then I have other teammates, not just from Slovenia. I had teammates from Africa, from Cameroon, from Guinea, where we played together because, because you share a common goal you establish a friendship that mm. you you're going to have together forever. So it's the mm. same thing for me coming to Estonia. I came to Estonia. I'm American, you know, but I come here with a common goal to be the best basketball player that I can be and to win basketball games and win championships. I come here. Now I meet the teammates here that are Estonian. Now me and we are friends. We're close. We're, we have a common goal where we're now we're building a bond together that, that can stay together forever. I can be five years down the road and I can text, Hendrick or Robin and boom we having a conversation or they can help me with something or I can help them with something you know that's I think that's the most important thing about going to America 
and going to let's say a European going to America for basketball is it's really bigger than basketball it's the experience of seeing something new you know being in a new environment you know um, being in a different culture and then okay yes you're being a basketball player you want to maximize your opportunity to make it to the highest league mm-hmm. and that's the NBA but at the same time if you don't make it to the NBA don't look at it as a a downfall look at the experience that you you know you had in life um okay let's continue with Tartu mm-hmm. when you I assume you got a call or a text or an email that Manu, what do you think of this option? Mm-hmm. Have you heard something about Estonia before that phone call? Or uh, what was your first thoughts when you got this news? That mm-hmm. So, okay, I, I know a lot of guys know that I was in a, I was at Talina Caleb first. So I was playing in uh, Caleb first. And, um, you know, the situation happened while I was there. And, um you know, everyone knows the situation happened that was there. So I decided to come here. So yeah, I got the phone call. Um, Yanar, no, no, no. He texts me on a... Let's stick to Estonia. Okay, let's also, uh, stick to Estonia. When you first uh, heard that uh, there is an offer or they want you to be part of the Tallinn Kalev team. Okay, so when I was in Tallinn Kalev... Uh, so what was your thinking like? Estonia? Do they play basketball there? Or what? Let's say a little bit. Yeah, it was... It was, it was uh, it was for sure uh, like uh i was happy that someone gave me an offer yeah i had other offers too already mm-hmm. before deciding to come excuse me come to estonia and go to talina caleb but i kind of knew already about estonia because um i was really i'm really good friends with brandis Israeli ross he, he's mm-hmm. you know played in uh estonia for multiple years and i had another close friend of mine played in uh for Caleb last season for a little bit before he went back to the States. So he, um, they told me about Estonia. I was, I was excited to come to Estonia because I was able to play with Ross. Like Ross is someone to me that is, that's like my big brother. He's Mm -hmm. someone that helped me understand the game of basketball when I was wanting to develop my game a lot and become a professional. Um, You know, he's played in Estonia, he's played in other countries and in Europe as well. So the opportunity to play with somebody that's like family to you, it's small, it's slim to none in Europe. So because I had that chance, I wanted to take that opportunity with him, you know? Okay, things didn't go, it didn't work out the way it wanted to work out when we first, you know, had the opportunity to do it. But that was, that was the more excite. that was my excitement, was to play with him together. Okay, things went the way it did and, you know, now I'm here, but that my excitement was more to come to Estonia and to play with him together than to, let's say, alone just mm. to come to Estonia. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tartu, mm-hmm. when you made the switch from Tallinn to Tartu, mm-hmm. how has the city been treating you? How is our team? Uh, it's love. Uh, the organization here has been treating me so good. Uh, I can I can't even explain how good they've been treating me. Uh, it, it reminds me that when people believe in you, like this is, you asked me earlier, why do I play so hard on the basketball court? The reason I play so hard is because when I see people that believe in me, like you guys do here in Tartu, then it, it gives me the energy to be like, I'm going to go out on the court and do everything that I can possibly do for the organization. So the, me coming to Tartu has been good. Um, Everyone, the teammates has been great. The coach has been great. You've been great with me, helping me develop my game inside and out already. Um, everyone, you know, from strength and conditioning to athletic training, like the, I feel like the opportunity is really to become better and develop, especially in Tartu. I, I've been to other, let's say, um, other teams and clubs in Estonia, like playing against them. I'm not sure. I don't know how their organization is ran. But being in one organization in Estonia already and then coming to another one, I see the difference. Mm-hmm. And what you guys are doing here in Tartu is amazing. I think is is can continue to go get back to where Tartu used to be as far as, a, you know, the basketball side of it. But as far as just the whole, let's say, Tartu University or just the whole complex here, it, it's, it's, it's nice to see how how you guys focus on training and developing from young guys to – to the to the prime um, professionals. Okay, 
Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I uh, I'm seeing in you is that you have this inner motivation and uh, to become a better player and do the next step because mm-hmm. uh, I think that's important to say that because nowadays a lot of players uh, think that uh, coaches will take, make them better. Mm-hmm. I will hire some coaches, they will make me better. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I go to this club, they are responsible for making me better. But mm-hmm. I see that you are taking the, resp- the responsibility on yourself to improve yourself, mm-hmm. uh, firstly. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I will uh, check if we have some questions. Uh, mm-hmm. um, one moment. Nii, ma vaatan, okay. kas meil on küsimusi tulnud. Üks moment. Aha, päris huvitavad küsimused. Alustame siis ühest lihtsamast. Jan Martinis asking, uh, which car do you like? Maybe he's thinking, which which is your favorite car? Oh, favorite type of like vehicle? Automobile, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, my favorite car? I have two. My dream car is, is an Audi R8. Audi i8. Uh-huh. Okay. And then another one is I want a Jeep Wrangler. All black Jeep Wrangler. I hope you get them. <laughs> uh, Jan Martin is also asking, uh, how big is your uh, foot size? For, uh, I think in... European Europe- numbers. European numbers, I think it's 50. Yeah, 50.5. Nii, when you ask the Jala number, on siis 50 pool. Uh, Patrick is asking who is the toughest player to guard in the Estonian league yeah and why toughest player to guard in the Estonian league toughest player to guard in the Estonian league okay guard I'll for sure say Marcus King and why because he he he's from Kalev Grama Yeah, Caleb Carver. Yeah, the point guard, Marcus King. Um, he's really, he's really shifty guard. He can score in many ways. He's a three-level scorer and he plays unselfish. So, like, if you're thinking to stop him, to focus your defense on stopping him, he plays a lot with his team, where he will always make the right play and the right pass. So, I think, uh, I think Marcus King is one of the toughest players to guard. Okay. What about man. big guys? Big guys. Toughest. Um, they are watching. Be careful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> toughest, toughest. I give my respect to for sure to to Plaus. Plaus. For, Latvian from Parno. From Parno, yeah. Why, 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 why is he so tough to play against? Because what makes he, him good? He's he's physical. He's a very physical guy. Uh, He uses his dom- his strengths to his abilities to help him get in p- good positions. Um, right now, that's what I'm focusing on too is getting stronger, so I can I can avoid things like that. So guys can always push me around down in the low post. Okay. Thanks. Next question, uh, JJ. I don't know who's JJ, but JJ is asking, what is the strangest thing about Estonia? Or Estonians? Estonia. And Estonian people, maybe. Uh, uh, nah, not not really much with Estonian people, but let's say Estonia. I wouldn't say it's strange, but I didn't know that it snows this much in a row. Like, it snows a lot in Estonia. So I didn't expect, like, when Ross told me it snowed, I was like, ah, oh, there's no way it can be this bad. And then I get here and it's been snowing for months, like every, every, like literally every day. I didn't expect it to be that, that crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's probably the weirdest thing. But this, as far as Estonian people, nothing, everyone's normal. And uh, Jan Martin also wants to know whether your homesickness is great. Oh, uh. He's concerned. Yeah, right now, right now I'm okay. I remember last year around this time when I was in Croatia, it was pretty difficult because I was ready to go home. And it's not because I didn't want to play basketball no more, but just because, you know, I'm such a family person that I love to be around my family. Um, I'm not really too homesick. 
but I am, I, let's say I am anticipating seeing my family once I get home. Who do you miss the most? I for sure miss my mother the most. Okay. Nii, kas kellegil on veel küsimusi, kirjutage julgelt siia chati. Nagu näha, Manu vastab hea meelega. Ärge üldse ämärage, kirjutage küsimused julgesti chati. Do you know, uh, Jan Martin, <laughs> our main man Jan Martin is asking if you can say something in Estonia. What have you learned in Estonia? Uh, see, that's why I need to learn. Someone needs to teach me. I only know the, I know, you know, how to say thank you, Aita. Uh, you're welcome. It's Palon, right? Um, that's that's about it i need to i need to learn i need to pick up on my estonia i need somebody to teach me if anybody watching they can give me a tutor I'm... okay uh our next question comes from rudy uh rudy wants to know how many blocks have you uh how, how many shots have you blocked in one game what's your record oh uh, most shots I think the uh, last year I had, I want to say I, I had six or seven last year in a creation game. So I think that's my highest in one game. And how many dunks? In one game? Yeah. Um, I want to say maybe five. Yeah, five. Who's your favorite uh, player from our team? From our team? Yeah. Oh, you guys going to get me in trouble what with this one. Like you guys are gonna get me in trouble with this one. My favorite player, um, you can name uh, multiple players. Yeah, I would name. I would. I would name my favorite guys on the basketball court for sure. I would start with Robin, Robin Kivi. Yeah, Robin is good. Charles, Charles Barton. Everyone, I can't even name. I really all everyone. Uh, Hendrick, you know, Oil, Casper. Casper's really. Let me say, I answer this question. Make it easier. Casper right now is my favorite player. Right now, he's my favorite player. Can you expand on why? Why is what is he doing so good that he's not scoring many points or getting double doubles, but he has some something something he, he does. Really he he has something. It's a it's for me. Scoring is not it's not all of basketball is not all about scoring he's doing all the little things that people don't give most times people who watch basketball don't give credit to which is talking on defense which is playing help side which is getting a defensive rebound or defensive stop maybe he don't get the rebound but he's doing the box out that helps someone else gets the rebound um playing his role he knows that he doesn't need to come in to score 20 points or he doesn't need to score 10 15 points but if it comes to him he's confident enough to to do what it, what he needs to do. And I think his playing hard on the court is what makes me like him a lot right now. Thank you, good answer. Uh, Jan Jesper. Jan Jesper is asking, if you were not the basketball player, who would you be? If I wasn't a basketball player right now, I, I would be a, either an assistant basketball coach on a university team, or I would be an athletic trainer. Because I got my bachelor degree in physiotherapy. Same as me. Okay. Uh, let's end up with uh, the question about fans. They are not in uh, allowed in the gym right now, but yeah. I think when you started here, uh, was it also empty or? When I first started in in Calif, yeah, there was there was a little bit of fans. I heard Tartu had a good fan base, so. But you haven't seen them. I they haven't seen them. I'm a I'm a fans. If the way you guys say I play hard now, and there's no fans, if there were fans, I'll play a whole lot harder. I love like the interaction with the fans. I love the energy the fans bring, and I can't wait to. I don't know if the fans are coming back this season, but I I can't wait to see fans again in Tartu. Yeah, I, I want to experience it. If that, imagine how good would you play if there is a full house? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Thirty points, twenty rebounds. The energy will go from here to here. <laughs> okay. Let's hope they will be back soon. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, okay, as we I checked, we have a lot of uh, viewers that are uh, not really maybe interested in watching those uh, clips, so we'll, mm -hmm. we will skip them and uh, uh, do them maybe in a later later date. Okay. So, a big thank you for this interview, and I Anytime. wish you all the best. Thank you, also. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching. And if you guys see me, you can always come and say hello and. Don't be shy, the shy to come up to me. I'm not a scary guy. <laughs> yeah, Mano ütles, et kui näete teda kuski linna peal või spordioones, siis tulge visake tale käppa ja küsige paar küsimust. Ja õpetage tale midagi eesti keeles. See ei ole normaalne, et oskab ainult paluni aitäh. I said that they would, uh, it would be nice if they can teach you some more Estonian. Oh yeah, please. <laughs> All right, hästi. Aitäh, et vaatasite, aitäh, et kuulasite järgmise korra nii. Mm -hmm. Ciao.